Good morning, and thanks for joining us at Grace Church this morning. My name is Christian Monk. On a normal Sunday morning, you'd be able to find me serving in our student ministries downstairs, and I'm excited for when we get to do that again. I'm excited also for this morning as we have a brief interview with one of our ministry partners overseas. So stay tuned with us, and as we are looking forward to the, the next steps into reopening our physical location there in Ephrata, we do have an urgent need for those willing to serve on our tech, uh, tech team and also for our cleaning crew. If you'd be interested in any of these, please reach out to us at the church office so we can get you some more information. Let's get started. I am so glad that we're able to, to do this, to connect. And what I'd love to do is yeah. to start off and just for those in our church family who may not know you, uh, could you introduce yourself, kind of where you're serving, what you're doing, and how long you've been there? Yeah, sure. Um, well, actually, Ephrata uh, Grace Brethren Church, now Ephrata Grace Church, was one of my original, I think it's my second supporting church that I garnered before leaving for the field in 1985. So we've been partnering together for a very, very long time. And um, yeah, um, I've uh, served in the Central African Republic for, uh, boy, 25 some years. And the last, um, well, since 2015, I've been the director of crisis response uh, for Encompass World Partners. All of this has been under uh, the umbrella of Encompass World Partners. Mm. Excellent. All right. And uh, obviously you, you made a move there. Could you kind of describe now kind of the focus of your efforts uh, in your context with crisis response and what are you trying to accomplish through your work with that? Absolutely. Well, um, for most of my life, I've been, you know, working, like I said, in Africa and um, among the Fayyad Pygmy people, doing orphan work and things like that. Um, but uh, now under crisis response, it's really been an amazing and exciting ministry. My, um, my, initial, my goal is to equip the church to be able to serve in crises <coughs> because, <coughs> excuse me, because when uh, an, like a crisis presents an uh, open door, an opportunity for the church to bridge into their community and serve people who are in need. I just heard a really cool A.W. Tozer quote. He said, a frightened world needs a courageous church. Mm -hmm. And so really in a, in a thumbnail, that's what I'm trying to do is equip the church to be able to serve um, in a really meaningful way in crises. And um, yeah, right now, the whole world is in a crisis. So uh, we're really, really busy. It's been awesome to see how the Lord's at work. But that's in a nutshell is what we're doing. Excellent. And you've been working with, um, like you've been going places yourself, going places with individuals and uh, kind of mobilizing teams to help meet these needs in a variety of ways, correct? Yes, yes. Excellent. Yeah, for example, last um, May, June, we had a tornado come through and uh, impact two of our Grace uh, Karis churches in Dayton. And so we mobilized teams to go and help them, but not just Karis churches, we go all over the, the world, uh, wherever. Right, and I even believe, um, I don't really remember which crisis it was, but uh, one or two from our church family was able to kind of connect yes. in and go down was it was it to Florida? Yeah. I believe to, to yes, it was. Florida yeah, Florida. yeah, that was yes, that was Hurricane Irma, and um, yeah, we we put together a team. Actually, the pastor Pastor Justin from York uh, pulled together people from Ephrata, from York, from mm -hmm. uh, a couple other churches. I'm I'm blanking out right now, but it was awesome. We went down and served our. In that case, again, it was Karis churches in in uh, North Florida. So that's kind of the stuff you're doing. It's uh, not just like out there somewhere in the broad unknown. It's, it's, it's local right. wherever crisis is taking place. Right. A lot is, uh, has been in North America. A lot of what we've done is, has been in North America, but it's not exclusive to that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, could you share, um, in, in, again, your context of ministry, maybe a, a recent win that you could, uh, you could point to? Oh, wow. Um, I don't even know where to start. I mean, like I said, um, the whole world is in crisis. And um, 
one of the challenges that I've had is um, lack of vision because really, I mean, before I got into this ministry, I, I kind of avoided crisis too. Who wants to be in crisis? And so it's hard to get people to prepare for crises and to serve in crises. Um, but I mean, this has been amazing to see God opening up the eyes of churches around the world, communities around the world. And um, so the most recent one was just, I got an email this morning from Kyrgyzstan wondering if, um, if we can help them out with, um, I'm going to move over here so you can't hear the wind as much. Um, yeah. So, uh, helping out, um, uh, one of our church planting teams in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, to serve. They're going to do food distribution. We've got 25 projects going in Argentina. We have five projects going in the Philippines. I mean, just all over. It's just there really been no, no shortage of opportunities to come alongside of our, of our churches in this case and to serve with our missionaries and local churches. Wow. Well, that, that's, that's exciting to hear. And, and the fun thing is, uh, I'm guessing... 80% of the people who watch this video don't even know where Kyrgyzstan is. So now you can <laughs> to Google when we're done with. Uh, exactly, yeah. Okay, so how has, I know you, you shared a little bit about this, but how has that COVID-19 situation affected you personally, as well as kind of in your area of ministry service? Well, I'll uh, start with ministry, because it's a good, um, you know, just what we've been talking about. Um, uh, it has been amazing, um, you know, right now that everybody in the world is in crisis. And so everyone is wondering how they can reach out. And we have expertise and resources that we've made. So it just makes my job so much easier and so much rewarding. Um, on a personal level, it's, it's been rough because my father's 91. And um, it's been, he's in a, he actually is at Garden Spot Village there in New Holland, Pennsylvania. He loves it there, but this has been extremely stressful. And so it's, it's kind of hard and we just have to, I call him every day and try to encourage him. But um, yeah, it's just, that's, it's rough. And I'm sure there's many people there listening to this um, who are experiencing the same things with uh, elderly parents, grandparents and things like that. It's kind of rough. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, even though difficulty, like what you're, you're dealing with 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 your dad being in that situation, you're still seeing God work through this whole situation to open doors up. In a powerful way, honestly, Pastor Brad, I, 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 my early on, I determined I will not be afraid of this. Uh, God is sovereign over all, even over tiny little coronaviruses. He can control pathogens. Um, and frankly, the Corona in, in Spanish means crown, which reminds me of the sovereignty of God. And he can, um, I think it's in Psalm 104, he talks, he talks about how he uses winds as his hmm. messenger and flames as his servant. So he's on top of this. And so this is an amazing opportunity for the church to serve. Um, the, 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 um, posture that I want to hold in all of this is kind of like with my eyes wide open and my mouth kind of like like this and my hand kind of cupped over it's like what on earth is God doing it's good uh, he's calling people to himself and he's opening up large windows and doors for the church to enter into at this time so um I think not, not just because I'm in crisis response, but for any of us, this is a time when God is powerfully at work. So it's and easy to be right. enthusiastic. These days. Yeah, you would say that that's not just out there somewhere. Right. That's the truth for even a little church like ours in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Huge that God is doing. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. And it's yeah. interesting. We just went through a series, a uh, message series we really focused on the big first point was God is in control. So I don't have to be in control. Amen. Amen. Yep. All right. Well, real quickly before we wrap up here, could you let us know two or, or three specific ways that you're supporting churches can be praying for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the first one is just um, that God will give us wisdom and confidence to know which of the many 
doors we should go through in serving and how to serve. Um, we, like, like right now, right in front of me are 40 doors and I'm hoping we can go through all of them. Um, but there'll be a lot more as, uh, as this crisis continues. So just wisdom to know which of these we should enter and how we can best serve. Um, that would be the first one. Um, and included in that would be vision, that the church will have vision. Um, now, I, I used to think you know, when I saw a crisis happen, it's like, oh, those poor people, I hope somebody, I hope somebody helps them. And now it's like, ah, uh, that somebody is me, that somebody is us. So we need vision to know which doors to go through. Um, the second one would just be, uh, yeah, on a personal level for my, my father. And um, yeah, just that um, God will comfort him and, and uh, that that will not be a distraction for me because I can't do a whole lot about it except to love on him and call him. And um, yeah, those would be my, my big ones. And they are in luck, right? Like you can't even go in to see him, correct? No, no. Mm -mm. I actually drove down there just, in, I was in Columbus, Ohio, and I went six and a half hours just to have picnic dinner or lunch with him. Um, and I couldn't get in. I mean, we had to meet someplace. <laughs> so we kind of cheated a little bit, but I, I'm very, very careful. So Barb, I just got busted. You cheated, I think. Barb. I know, I know, I know, I know. Thank you so much to the Effort of Grace family for years and years of ministry together. It's been awesome, and God continues to work in powerful ways. So, yes, please, I'd appreciate your prayers. All right, thanks so much, Pastor Brad. Thank you, my friend. Bye-bye. my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like a lot lately about how our actions speak just as loudly to others as our words do. It's easy to say the right things or to say the good things that we think people want to hear, but it's entirely different and a lot harder to actually live those things out. But we want the people that are around us in our community, in our family, um, in our circles of friends to know that we're living Jesus-centered lives and our actions need to reflect that. Fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure. Just the sum of every high and every low. Remind me once again just who I am because I need.
Good morning, Grace Church. Uh, again, it's so great to have you here. Thanks for joining us for another in our uh, virtual gathering opportunities. And while we're continuing it this way for, for the foreseeable future, the end is in sight, where we're going to be able to start gathering back together, uh, most likely in some smaller groups, and then eventually all together. And I can't wait. But I want to thank you for continuing to join us, for continuing to be part of what we're doing uh, remotely to continue this fellowship and this worship of the great God who has saved us and called us into a glorious life on mission. And so that's why we're doing this series we're doing now. We're doing this series, I Am Jesus. And again, this is not saying that I am Jesus or that you should be saying that you are Jesus, but who is Jesus according to what he said he is? And that's the question that we've been wrestling with. What does Jesus say about himself? Who does he say that he is? And Jesus himself, again, recognized the importance of this question. We looked at this uh, from the very beginning of this series that we're in. While he was with his disciples, he asked them, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they gave a whole variety of answers. And quite frankly, all those answers were incorrect. So Jesus said to his disciples, to his close followers here, but who do you say that I am? And again, as we've talked about this already for, for several weeks, when it comes to our faith as followers of Jesus, the single most important question, because it answers all the other questions, or it serves as the foundation 
for all the other questions, is this one? Who is Jesus? And I would suggest that the best way to determine who we think Jesus is, how we would answer that question, is to learn from him about what he said about himself. So that question that we're looking at really becomes, what does or who does Jesus say he is? And we started this all off, our first week together, where Jesus claimed a remarkable, uh, scandalous thing uh, in his setting. He claimed to be the great I am. We said that this was a way amongst the Jewish audience that he was speaking to, where he was claiming the very sacred name of the divine author of the universe. That he was claiming the name that was so sacred that many Jewish people would often not even utter it uh, out loud. If, if it was in the, the text of the Bible they were reading, they would say a different word just to show honor and reverence for this great name. And Jesus said that I am he. He actually said before Abraham was, before the forefather of the entire Jewish nation and the Jewish faith, before him I existed. Jesus claimed to be the pre-existent, timeless author of all things, the great I am. And then last week, we were in John chapter 6. So the first week, we were in John chapter 8. Then we went back to John chapter 6 for the first of what are classically called the I am statements of Jesus. And he claimed to be the bread of life. And then the whole idea of this bread of life was that at the, the core of everything, that Jesus is the one who sustains us. And that I have to make a choice about what will I rely upon to sustain me? Will I rely upon myself or will I, reply, uh, will I rely upon others, like the government or my parents or uh, this job or whatever it might be? Will it be myself, will it be others, or will it be the one who designed everything? Well, we said that Jesus needs to be the one that sustains us? And will I let him? Will I choose to be sustained by him? And all this is in the book of John, the gospel of John. What is the gospel? Again, the good news of who Jesus is, according to this follower of Jesus, John. Well, we keep going. We get back to John chapter 8 this week. And while last week we spent uh, a lot of time going through a whole bunch of verses because it was really packed out there, Jesus kind of crafted this big, long argument about why he was the bread of life and what that meant. We're going to return there, but for just a little bit. By that, I mean, we're only going to really be looking at one verse in John 8 today and then a couple other places where John talks about the similar thing. But we've learned that he's the great I am, the divine author of all things. We've learned he's the bread of life, the one who sustains us. This week, we're going to learn that Jesus said that he is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of of the world. And where we find that is in, is in John chapter 8 and verse 12. So you can see it up on the screen. You can follow along if you've got your, your Bibles there with you at, at home or if you're uh, listening or watching at the gym or wherever you're at, feel free to look it up, kind of follow along with it. So we're going to zip around here in John. But in John chapter 8 and verse 12, we see Jesus saying this. It says, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You have to understand that what John is doing here is he's tapping into a motif, a kind of, kind of a theme of light versus darkness. And this is not something that is unique to John. It's not just something that he does, but we find it prevalent throughout the entire Bible, both what's called the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures that were uh, written primarily around the Jewish people, and as well as the New Testament, the ones that were primarily around the revelation of Jesus and those who would follow him afterwards. See, these words appear together and are contrasted when they're together more than 50 times in both the Old and the New Testaments. And again and again, it goes back to this comparison of light being good and darkness being evil. And we see that John does this many places in his own gospel. Many places throughout his gospel, and even if we would go to the letters that he wrote later, there's, in addition to the gospel of John, he also wrote three other letters that are included in the New Testament part of our Bibles. 
And he talks about them there as well as here in his gospel. But rather than look at all of them, we're going to look at four to kind of give us an idea of the richness of what it means when Jesus said that he was the light of the world. Because it really is light in opposition or comparison to darkness and seeing the interplay between them. So what we're going to do is we're going to zip back to the beginning of John. We're going to go to John chapter 1, and there's lots there, but we're only going to look at two verses. Even though there's more in John chapter 1 talking about light and dark, let's just look at at verses 4 and 5. And this is John describing Jesus, and he says, In him, in Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So the thing we learn about darkness is that it can only exist in the absence of light. So when the light is present, the darkness can't win. It can't be there. It simply exists when the light is not. So the dark can only win in this scenario when the light is shut out, when the light is not there or not allowed in. And here's one of the glorious truths and one of the great mysteries of the faith and of the created order that God has put together. See, God is powerful enough that he could demand everything to happen exactly the way he wants. That there would be no choice given. But he decides because he is a God of love, He wants to love, and he desires love in return, that he will not force others to make that decision. So he he makes his light available. We'll see this. The light shines in the darkness, but he allows humanity the choice to shut it out or to obscure the light, to not let the light shine in to the darkness. But we see here at the very beginning of John, he sets up this theme. Well, then we're going to hop ahead to chapter 3. And here's what we read in chapter 3 in verse 19. It says, and this is the judgment. Here's the, here's the, the thinking about the whole situation. Here's the conclusion. The light has come into the world, and the, and the people, the people here, loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And this is such a, a difficult thing, but it's because God has allowed that choice that light was brought into a dark place, but the light was not accepted. The light was not uh, allowed in. It was rejected or it was obscured. And why does John tell us here? Because people loved to be in the dark, because in the dark, what they were doing was allowed. See, The presence of the light shows off everything that is in darkness. So there could be all kinds of things in a room that we don't know about are hidden and and, uh, and could be kept from the view of others. But as soon as light comes in, it's shown off for what it is. And quite frankly, it's easy to fear giving up that which is kind of mine in the dark uh, because I fear what will happen if it's exposed. Maybe I don't want to let go of what I'm doing in the dark, those things that would be considered evil. Maybe I'm embarrassed of what people would say if they saw it. But when I do that, I'm loving the darkness rather than the light. But John keeps going. There's there's more examples here of this coming about. So we look here in chapter 12 and verse 35 of the Gospel of John. So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. And understand here, there's there's a uh, kind of an immediate uh, meaning and application and then a broader one. See, Jesus was saying, hey, I'm here with you. Don't miss it. I'm here with you now. Listen to me. Hear me. Work with me. Walk with me now. Walk in the light because I'm not going to be here always. He was talking about being here and now on the earth walking with his followers before his his death, burial, and resurrection. But there's also another one where the idea is that the light is among us right now. But eventually it won't. But as long as we have access to the light, this side of life, this side of death, as it were, I have access to that light. What will I choose to do? Because if I walk in the light, we're told that there is life. But 
if I don't, if I don't walk while I have the light, walk in respect to that light, uh, the darkness will overtake me. That is the, the choice that Jesus is giving. You can choose now what to do. You have the access to the light. Will you take it? Because look here what he says. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. We have the light of Jesus available to us now. And as long as we do, we can step out of the darkness. But we'll, a time will come when we no longer have that option. And we will be, have gone to the place of darkness. We will have rejected the light. So being in the darkness means that we'll bump into things. Okay, just we know that if, you, if you're in a dark room, even a familiar room, but it's dark, it's pitch black, you can't see, you end up bumping into things. And we often will hurt ourselves or, or others. And when we do that, we're, we're hurting the very ones, ourselves or others, that God loves, that he lived, died, and rose again for. We can't wander into the darkness and not hurt, hurt ourselves or hurt others. So that's why we have to walk in the light. And there's a limited, finite amount of time for us to make that decision. In the, the faith tradition that we're a part of as followers of Jesus, we say that that is before the death of our bodies or before Jesus comes back, whichever comes first. Because we believe as a core tenet of our faith that one day Jesus will return in victory and will set all things right. But at that point, we will have had our opportunity to respond to the light. So look here what he says. We know if we're walking in the darkness, we're going to bump into things. We're going to hurt ourselves and hurt others. But there's a choice that needs to be made. But what he says further, just a few verses later here in chapter 12, verse 46, Jesus says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. See, that's the point of the light coming in. The point of the light coming in is not to point out all the bad and say, now you better get in line. The point of the light coming into the world is to provide a way out of the darkness, out of the despair, out of the hopelessness, out of the purposelessness, out of the loneliness, out of the shame, out of all the things that this world heaps on us. And it's not because of what I do. It is about belief. We do not need to stay in the darkness, my friends. It's choice. Here's the thing. That choice is a choice of dependence, not one of achievement. What I mean by that is the choice I make is not one, well, I'll just start doing enough good things to, to claw my way out of the darkness and towards the light. Jesus says here it's belief. It's a heart condition. It's an act of the will towards the Lord to turn towards him and accept his free gift, payment for my sins, which the Bible says we all have. The Bible says every one of us has, has sinned and every one of us does sin. And that the result of sin, the wages of sin, what sin earns is death, separation from God. Now and for eternity, if it's not if that debt, if that wage, what it is owed is not paid. And yet Jesus paid it all and works to restore and rebuild and redeem all that the sin, all that the darkness has damaged and broken. Whoever believes in him will not remain in darkness. I cannot achieve it. I can only depend upon him to provide it. And that's a... A, a, a mindset, a way of thinking about it, a way of belief at the deep parts of me that is no longer me who's able to steer the ship, but allowing him to and responding in gratitude. So if we go back to Jesus's clear statement here in John chapter eight, I am the light of the world, John eight twelve. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, look here, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, this is very interesting. You see, to follow Jesus, what we believe we're called to do, he, at Grace Church, we exist to help people live Jesus-centered lives, so that it's all about Jesus, who he is, what he's done, and what he calls us to do. 
But to follow him means you walk in the light. You walk in a way that represents, that reflects, that shines forth the light of Christ to the world around us. If we follow Jesus, we will not walk in darkness. In essence, we'll not do those things which are evil. We will walk away from those things towards the things that are light. But catch it here. We don't walk out of the darkness to earn the light. We walk out of the darkness because we have the light. It is such a different perspective. It's different than virtually every other major religious movement throughout the history of mankind. That it is not a act of religious duty to earn the favor and will of God. That God bestows it upon us because he made us in his image and he loves us and desires us and pursues us, gives to us the light of life through sheer belief that he has willed it and made it available and says, will you accept the payment? Will you accept my invitation to life? And when we do, we walk in the light rather than the darkness, not to earn the light, but because we already have it. It's been said this way, we don't do to be. We don't act in order to be part of God's family, but because we're part of God's family, then we act, that we don't walk in darkness, but rather walk in light out of an extreme sense of gratitude and joy for what God has done in our lives, that we've seen how beautiful and marvelous and amazing and wonderful God is, the extravagance of his love towards me, and I can't help but respond in a way that brings him joy, that shows him off to be all the things that I've seen him to be. So what's our big point? If you take notes, I'd love for you to jot this down. And that is this, that Jesus is the light that dispels the darkness in our lives. Jesus is the light of the world, and that light dispels the darkness in our lives. So here are kind of my two questions for you. Kind of an overarching one and then two underneath it. Where does Jesus' light need to shine in my life? Jesus is the light of the world he claimed to be, and I would suggest that throughout Scripture he's proven himself to be. If he's the light of the world, where does that light need to shine? First of all, have I allowed Jesus' light to dispel the darkness within me? Have I crossed over from death to life? Have I said, Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner and I cannot pay that debt. Please pay it for me and I want to follow you with all my life. If you've never done that, today's the day to do that, and today's the day to reach out to us, and I would love to chat with you through the exciting journey that you're about to take. And if we have done that, and I pray and hope that everyone listening now has already done that, but if you have, have I been loving darkness in some part of my life? I'll suggest it's easy to do. It's easy to allow that light to kind of come in in so many places, but still have little dark corners that we hold on to. I don't know what that is for you, but are you willing to ask that question? Are you willing to say, Jesus, let your light shine to all the dark places? Maybe you're obscuring the light when it comes to your rights, what you deserve. Maybe it's not your stuff, your possessions, your money. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's your affections, the things that you yearn over and seek with your heart, or allow your emotions to be involved with. Maybe it's your secrets, the things that you are hiding. And maybe they're things that you're not even proud of, even things that you despise, but you're so fearful of what would happen if the light came to it. What I want you to know is that allowing the light of Jesus into your life, into all the dark corners, it dispels the darkness and even though just like when you're in darkness and lights get thrown on, I do this to my wife almost every morning. I throw all the lights on and her first reaction is to pull the covers up over her head to avoid the light. Now she needs the light to get up and move around the room and get the day done. But it's so bright. And there's a, when you're in darkness, you automatically reflexively kind of block it out. But as you can go ahead and pull those covers back down and let the light in, your eyes not only become accustomed to the light, it enables you to see and to do exactly what you need to see and to do. You can walk into the joy and the purpose of your day and your eternity. 
So where does Jesus' light need to shine in your life right now? Well, this is the third of our I am statements of Jesus. We've, we've wrestled with this idea of finding our identity in him, in Jesus. And to do that, we need to know who he is. For me to know who I am in Jesus, as a follower of Jesus, I need to know who he is. And we discover today that he is the light that dispels the darkness in me. And what John says later in one of his letters is that as, as w Jesus walks in the light, I should walk in the light. As he is in the light, so I should be in the light. Now next week, we're going to discover something that is even in our world today a little bit more controversial that Jesus said when we'll discover that Jesus allows entrance into God's family. But for today, I want to thank you again for joining us. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus or take the next step in your journey, please reach out to us. We'd love to partner with you. We'd love to be in that journey with you. And again, as you're able to continue to support the work of both reopening our church building to group gatherings, as well as to reach out to the many needs and more needs are coming in every week, requests for help, as you're able to help continue support financially what's going on. That would be a blessing to our church family and to our community. And you can see there on your screen and the screen that will follow the ways that you can do that. Thanks, church family. I love being a part of you. I love serving with you. I love worshiping with you. And I can't wait to see you all again.